All right, well, welcome to Apex Inland Empire's uh, Lunch and Learn webinar series. And I want to thank uh, Craig, who is with us today. Uh, let's see here. So I wanted to, um, we have a very exciting topic uh, today to talk about. Uh, artificial intelligence, computer vision, uh, the inattentional blindness. So another tool to leverage for your supply chain. This should be very interesting. Um, and we'll, we're looking forward to learning about AI. It certainly is all over the news these days. And uh, Craig Smith um, leads, has, um, has had a really um, great history here um, in e-commerce and um, most recently in AI. Uh, Craig has led the e-commerce operations startup for both Costco.com as well as Jacuzzi Brands, uh, Joan Fabrics and Crafts, iHerb, uh, Coupang, and many more. He has guided operations in manual, semi-automated, and fully automated distribution centers featuring innovations as semi-autonomous robotics. Um, and uh, he is now um, knee-deep in artificial intelligence. So... We're excited to have uh, Craig uh, talk to us about this webinar. And uh, just as a reminder, and I'll close as well in terms of uh, APIX, but APIX Inland Empire is um, uh, APICS-IE.org. We hold webinars, uh, tours, uh, executive panel networking symposiums, and uh, much more. So please uh, check us out on our website. We actually have two classes coming up this week, so uh, you could, we could um, handle a few last minute registrations if you're interested in CPIM part one and CPIM part two. Uh, one is starting this week, one's starting next week. So if you're interested, please check it out on our website. And also please note our upcoming symposium uh, in November, and it's gonna be about collaboration uh, in uh, with advanced manufacturing and, uh, and, and your supply chain. And it should be a really great panel. We have some really um, um, compelling speakers. So we hope you'll join us. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Craig, uh, who's going to you know, tell us all about AI and computer vision and what that even means. So uh, thank you, Craig. And actually, uh, Craig is a former um, executive panel um, uh, panelist as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think knee deep is perhaps um, an understatement. I'm, I'm up to my eyeballs in um, AI computer vision. It's been interesting. It's been interesting to take this leap from, from e-commerce operations and everything having to do with outbound logistics to artificial intelligence. I had started a consulting group in 2014 and last year I picked up uh, the company that I'm working for now intrinsics imaging as a client specifically they wanted to be able to figure out how to apply their technology into areas outside of what they started in and they started with uh, law enforcement and public safety and they were interested in my experience in supply chain and logistics to see if there was a fit for AI computer vision there so before I get too deep into that, let's let's talk a little bit about what exactly AI computer vision is and why it exists. So uh, there's a scene, uh, and it's it kind of dates me, I guess, in the 1933 black and white Groucho Marx classic Duck Soup, where where Groucho uh, in one scene uh, is standing there talking to this woman. She turns her back. He walks out, and then Chico, disguised as Groucho, comes out. She turns around, she says, I thought you just left. And, and he says, no, I never left. And she, says, she says, but you just left. He says, no, who are you going to believe? Me or your own lying eyes? Which is kind of at the core of computer vision uh, and specifically artificial intelligence. Uh, it comes down to the ability of people to be able to see things and recognize things. And actually how um, we're not terribly good at that. If you ask any any lawyer, any criminal defense lawyer, they'll tell you in a heartbeat that that a eyewitness is probably one of their least um, favorable of evidentiary pieces because vision is is so subjective and so so subject um, to misinterpretation um, and and overall unreliability. So there's a couple concepts that are well-studied, well-known, um, called inattentional blindness 
and change blindness. Um, as humans, we're exposed to a richly detailed visual world. We've got a lot of information coming at us, and we can only pay attention to so much information in terms of visual uh, cues. Uh, the Department of Psychology at Harvard did a study, and they did a video on it, and I recommend that any of you viewers go on YouTube and look it up. It's called Gorillas in Our Midst, M-I-D-S-T. And it shows what uh, shows an example in a laboratory setting of how unreliable uh, our vision actually is. If, if you haven't seen that video before, go, rec I go see it. And at least half of you or more will probably miss what happens or won't be able to catch what it's about. So <clears throat> AI computer vision is intended to be able to not necessarily replace uh, what a person can see, recognize, but it's sort of as a tool to enhance. It can replace in many instances, but it's not, it's not, um, I, I think it always, it's, it's better to have a human uh, as a backup to it because, because vision and being able to cognitively recognize things is such a challenging, uh, challenging task to be able to do. So, AI computer vision takes scientific approach to be able to augment our ability to be able to see what humans can normally see, as well as those things that our eyes and our minds are not normally able to see or comprehend, like um, high-speed motion, patterns uh, that repeat themselves over long periods, very small objects, things like that. <clears throat> but at the very core of artificial intelligence computer vision is the concept that if a person can see and recognize something, AI computer vision can be taught to do so as well. So there's two elements that you need to be able to do this. You need eyes and you need a brain. The eyes are the cameras, the video cameras, the still cameras that take motion and still uh, video feeds and then send that to the brain. And that's where AI computer vision exists. These are complex algorithms that I've, I've learned as I've been um, immersing myself in this field that it is very much uh, equal part science as it is art. Um, I've read articles where, where the, the technology is even more effective in the hands of people who, who uh, are able, able to, to do some of the intangible works that make, it, that make the algorithms function better. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting um, it's an interesting phenomenon. I've, I've asked our senior engineer before how it all works, and quite frankly, this is a this is a Harvard grad that that um, is extremely well educated, extremely well versed, and extremely experienced in artificial intelligence. He can't tell me. He says, "Well, we create these algorithms, we teach it, and then at some point it starts learning itself. We don't know exactly how," which is kind of impressive, but it's also kind of kind of creepy when it comes to um, movies like The Terminator, you know, artificial intelligence, the, the systems take over and then they start ruling us. Anyway, that's an ingoing inside joke. But so that gives you kind of a, an idea of what artificial intelligence uh, is, where it lies in terms of um, equipment, cameras being the eyes, an actual computer that actually interprets what the eyes are feeding it. Um, intrinsics imaging, which was my client until um, earlier this year, I was brought on to be able to help them get into logistics and supply chain. Originally, they evolved from, um, they've got a background in military contracting. Um, the founder, the CEO, um, is a retired submarine commander. The uh, CTO, who began to work with him, um, is also the co founder. They met together after he retired at a military contractor that specified or did special work with um, computer recognition and video feeds on submarines and periscopes. Um, you know, many of us have seen the, the movies where the captain says, oh, bring us up the periscope depth. And then, a, then a, a sailor stands at the periscope looking and trying to identify threats on the surface and in the air. Um, in reality, that's a very challenging task for a sailor to do and um, my earlier concepts of inattentional blindness 
uh, come into play very fast there. You, you get exhausted at that and you become very ineffective over a relatively short amount of time. So what they were doing at the military contractor was designing video feeds that would be able to capture a 360 degree image of what's happening on the surface of the ocean and also in the air and then feed that video in through algorithms that would then go in and recognize surface vessels and air and aircraft and then take that to the next step of being able to identify whether they were friendly or or, or enemies uh, the direction that they were going the type of vessel that they were all automatically designed to augment that never completely replaced the sailor because the sailor was always there but this algorithm looking also at the surface would alarm saying hey you better check over here because i see something that you may not have seen so it's more of an enhancement of the of the human capability of the sailor watching the periscope so <clears throat> they did that with the military contractor and then struck out uh, on their own as intrinsic imaging four years ago and um, they took that technology that was that was created and working in very harsh um, environments, uh, you know, out at sea in submarines, to law enforcement. So the first customers that Intrinsic Imaging had was the Los Angeles Police Department. The LAPD back then had license plate reader technologies that were taking pictures of vehicles in order to use optical character recognition to pull off the, the drivers or the, the license plate. Unfortunately, if there was ever a crime that occurred that you didn't get the license plate, there was only a physical description, there was no way to search those millions of images. So Intrinsics Imaging's first product was a product called Mantis that went in there and was taught to recognize color, model, make, year, anything that you could see, a person could see on a video and recognize, the algorithm would then go in and recognize that in this huge database of images and assign those searchable attributes. Uber sticker, lift sticker, it's got a tailgate um, spoiler on the tail, it's got roof rack, it's got anything that you could recognize now becomes a searchable attribute and it made it completely more useful than just a simple, simple optical character re recognition. So the second product that they came up with was a, uh, the ability then to go from still pictures to motion pictures or video. So LAPD officers all wear body cams. Well, it was always a forensic tool, meaning if there was an incident that involved an officer wearing a body cam, they could go back and see what happened before and after that incident. However, if you were a training officer and you wanted to see, okay, I saw what happened here, but I wanna see other examples of, of this. And I wanna see how other officers reacted to it to see if we have uh, either an officer problem or a training problem. So what occurred was they asked us not only to be able to recognize motion in video, but they also wanted to know if we could add sound to it. I said, okay, so we tried and were successful. So now in these petabytes of video data, you can actually go in and say, okay, I want to, I want to find every instance where I can hear the siren of the police car, I can hear screeching tires, I can hear the officer getting out of his car. I can see the officer getting out of his car. I can hear the officer shouting commands, and I can see the officer drawing a weapon. I wanna see every instance of that. Now all of a sudden this mountain of video is completely usable in whatever scenario that you wanna be able to define to recognize, it will find you. So that's kind of what, it, what got Intrinsics image, Imaging started, was the license plate reader technology, the body cam footage, all in public safety. So I came in and, and um, I was familiar with the technology. I said, there's gotta be, there's gotta be options. There's gotta be opportunities for this in logistics and supply chain because that was my background. I think it's the coolest technology that I've ever been involved with or seen. Um, there's gotta be something. So I started thinking and I started calling all of the contacts that, of the networks that I've built over the years. And the consensus seemed to be in um, logistics is what's called reverse logistics. And I never really gave reverse logistics much thought. I mean, reverse logistics is essentially what happens to all the products that we buy that you return to the store, whatever happens to it. Not a lot of people think about that. All we 
are mostly involved with is traditional outbound. Everything goes out, everything has a barcode, machine readable code, uh, things can be automated, things are straightforward and easy. When stuff comes back, however, there's barcodes missing, it's not in its original box, the box, the uh, barcode or, or other machine readable code is covered with other stickers or what have you. And it's, it's very difficult in the reverse logistics industry to take advantage of automation. And as a result, it's a very manual and very expensive environment to operate. in. So um, I wanna show right now, I think you guys can see the screen of our website. I wanna show um, the video of our overseer product recognition. This was the first um, solution that we brought to the market last year specifically to handle the simple uh, initial sort of products coming into uh, a third-party logistics provider that's that's processing returns for uh, a number of electronics companies that are selling through Amazon and Best Buy. So I'm going to pop this up and, and let it run. There's an audio in the background. If you want to mute it, you don't need it. But the the um, th there's no voiceover. It's just the, it's just the captioning. So it'll kind of explain exactly what's what's going on. So without further ado. <laughs> Oh, make it quiet. So this is an example of the product that comes in after you've returned it to Amazon or Best Buy. It's just a huge, huge mess. And they'll cover it when they process it with their own labels so that they can bring it through their, their process. And you'll see the products have stickers all over the place. When they were using traditional sortation with a barcode reader, they were getting 50% of no reads, which would throw it all the way back to their jackpot lane, which put it back into the realm of completely manual processing. And you can see the jackpot area was this gigantic mishmash that, 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 that was probably at least half of a percent or 50% of everything that they had to handle. Our technology went in and actually was able to learn immediately after the barcodes were read, um, it would teach itself to recognize what the box would look like. And these are examples of, of the product re of being recognized without regard to whether there's a barcode on it or not. And how we did that was there was obviously a, a section on the sortation system that would read barcodes. Half the time it got it, and then half the time that it, that it, that it understand what the barcode was, our camera would take a picture of it and then be able to understand, okay, that's what this is, that's what this is. And when it stopped, if there was a barcode missing or, or covered, then the system would take over. It's like, oh, I've seen enough of these. I know what it is. I know where it needs to go. So that was our very first product in supply chain and logistics within a warehouse. Proof that we could, we could do um, something within a warehouse, within the private sector, which was what we thought was uh, potentially almost impossible to do. One of the biggest challenges to being able to do this is to be able to train it. And to be able to train it, you have to have a process that, uh, that is scalable. And we created a process that would leverage the existing barcode reader to successfully train it. And then the system would then, like I said, take over and when it didn't see the barcode, recognize what it was and sort. So that was our very first foray into logistics and supply chain. Our second one has come this year, and I, and I, I can't show any videos of it yet. Um, it's in action. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. It's a, it's a manufacturer, and all of their products ship out of their warehouse on flatbeds or drop decks. And they've been, they were having issues with um, improper loads or, or not understanding exactly what goes on a trailer. And they wanted to know if we would be able to, using an existing CCTV camera, could we count the number of pallets on a drop, drop, bed, drop bed, or drop deck and a flat bed. And we told them, and we saw the feed, said, if you can see it on the camera, and if you can count it, we can teach the algorithm to do that. And we've successfully developed that and rolled that out. And now as the 
trucks are leaving the building, we're able to actually count how many pallet positions are on there, and they're validating that with their outbound information to, to determine whether or not there's a short shipment or an over shipment, and they can catch, catch it before it gets, um, gets off the yard. Um, there are multiple other opportunities, we're pretty certain, within this space. Some of the other things that we've, that we've, uh, <laughs> that we're employing artificial intelligence, computer vision, um, asphalt shingle manufacturing, nobody thinks about that. It's one of the largest manufacturing, um, I guess, manufacturing uh, opportunities that still exist in America. Uh, the shingles that are on top of many people's roofs are, by necessity because of their weight, they're local. So there's actually almost two or 300 plants here in the United States that are located regionally that make these. Uh, and as such, they needed, they were interested in identifying ways to be able to, to do quality control on that, color recognition. Um, so here's, here's a real quick slideshow of what we're doing in the manufacturing realm. Hey Junka is the um, Six Sigma concept of it, and it has to do with minimizing uh, waste through early detection. And we're able to take those tasks that normally required a human that would uh, recognize color, determine if if the colors are out of out of uh, compliance, and being able to spot defects in high-speed manufacturing quicker than the existing people that they're doing it more reliably. Really, they reveal coating problems if there's enough granules on it. There's the color blend. If it's if we're able to tell um, things that a person can't even tell that that the color blend is accurate. Same thing with the fiberglass mat that goes under it. The packaging, <clears throat> all these things that can be seen visually in this manufacturing environment are being watched by existing cameras and running through our analytics to be able to key on specific uh, quality control issues. Um, another, I find extremely interesting um, project that we've been involved with that we're working on right now is buried deep in the ground underneath Los Angeles right now. The purple line extension for the Metrolink is going under the Brea Tar Pits. It's a, it's a several mile extension and there's these two gigantic tunnel boring machines the same type that were used to dig the channel under the English Channel connecting uh, um, England and France. So this, what you see right here, is a picture of what is going underneath Los Angeles right now. So here's another example where computer vision is being used to help uh, optimize the dig of these two gigantic tunnel boring machines. So these things, as they churn through the soil, they use these augers to take the dirt away. And as the dirt is being taken away, the operators need to know the consistency of that soil. And our algorithms are sitting there looking at it and can tell whether it's clay, sand, wet, dry, gravelly or not. And all of this is then fed to the operator of the bit, which changes the torque of the bit and changes how much lubricant is put on it to be able to get through the soil. Before, this was done by a person uh, at the end of the process, and the numerous mistakes that were caused would cause tens of thousands of dollars in delay and cost overruns to be able to, to change it far after the fact. So um, there's another example of our technology being used in um, places where you don't necessarily think about using it. But I know that within supply chain and logistics, there's even more opportunities to be able to use this. Um, my job is to be able to be out there, look, talk to people, uh, vet particular, particular opportunities to be able to, to um, determine whether or not uh, there's a fit for computer vision. So, um, <laughs> The other thing that California is also famous for, I mean, we're not the first, but um, agriculture, high value crops, cannabis. We're able to use our algorithms to overwatch commercial grows to be able to detect early warning and provide um, 
an instant message when the plants start to show signs of distress. And, uh, is when a, when a when a commercial grow um, experiences a crop failure, that's millions of potentially millions of dollars of of cost and profit that are lost. Now that we can be able to use our systems to watch it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that's um, this is not practical to do with with labor and manpower. <clears throat> so that's kind of it in a nutshell. At the at the core of this. Any process that relies on a human vision to recognize and classify an object, a motion, or even a sound like, I, like uh, we did with the uh, body cams, AI computer vision can make that more reliable and efficient. It can reduce the costs associated. It can reduce uh, the labor that's, that's required to do it. And um, those are just some of the industries that we're, we're applying this very cool technology in. So, um, I'm excited to be able to present this to you guys, and if you have any questions or, or any comments or questions, um, fire away. Yeah, so uh, for the participants, you can submit your questions through uh, Q&A or through the chat box. So, uh, you know, let us know what, what you'd like to understand further about, um, about AI and computer vision systems. So uh, while we're waiting for those questions to come in through uh, Q&A or chat, um, so Craig, what, um, um, what has been, uh, how do you think that this relates to just AI, to AI in general? Is it, is it really just a particular use of AI? Yeah, it, it, is, it is a subset, subset of artificial intelligence. You've got artificial intelligence that looks at big data to be able to do predictive modeling and analysis. Um, lots of marketing companies do that. Um, Google and uh, YouTube all, all employ artificial intelligence to one extent or another. Um, Google, for example, they, they do have uh, an object re recognition algorithm that's available publicly. And if you have an, if you have a picture, you can upload it and, and, and you didn't know what it is, they'll bump it against their database and the AI will return, well, this is what it is. This is what I think it is. Um, but that's a very, that's a very high level and, and kind of, um, it's a novelty use in some instances. Um, we're looking for very specific use cases where there's problems that uh, involve what we call high high value video streams, watching a specific area of an operation or a specific area of a supply chain that um, are particularly sensitive, that humans have been required to, to maintain and monitor. Our algorithms go in and um, enhance or sometimes replace uh, humans to do that, but yes, it's it's there's AI artificial intelligence in, in big data and other imagery and AI in um, Computer vision which is which is sort of our subset and that's that comes from obviously our our history in, in uh, military military contracting and all the experiences that we've had Deploying these solutions in very very harsh environments and actually, actually these 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 warehouses and city streets and roads uh, we're finding to be relatively easier for us to do than trying to figure out how to than what we had to do it out in the middle of the ocean um, under stressful scenarios and stressful instances um, that the sub submariners were faced with. Yeah, very good. How about um, if the uh, you know the folks here are mainly working with manufacturing and distribution to your point mm -hmm. about you know how to apply this to supply chain how can they be like they may not be in the like a position that can take take effect or you know take this into effect but they might be what what do you think that what could they be looking for or how do, how do we you know help find opportunities where we could utilize some technology like this where it would actually provide a return and how do we even know if it would maybe you know that's a lot of questions but maybe well, no, it, it's actually a very good question and, and because for example the asphalt shingle example that I provided that was uh, we were brought in based on um, a couple of the, the line operators uh, 
instructors or management. They were um, Six Sigma black belts and were completely dialed into the process flow. And they were able to identify, okay, in this point, at this point, in this point, um, is where we're typically relying on people to recognize and classify and make a call on it. Um, and they have typically the statistics on how reliable that is. And then, they'll, then they came to us and say, okay, this is where we have people doing this. We also have cameras watching this. Can you do that? So to answer your question, if you're involved in a manufacturing process in line and you understand what happens from, from the beginning of the line to the end of the line, um, and you know that there's spots where there's people that are, that are uh, relied upon to be able to make uh, a visual determination of something and then a decision based on that, um, that's step one. Um, similar sort of thing with, with uh, the supply chain, vehicles moving. Um, for example, we've got somebody who we're talking with with regards to identifying vehicles in the yard that are moving around. Can I tell the difference between um, ocean containers? Can I just, can your algorithm tell me what the, um, what the freight forward or what the carrier is on this? Can your freight forwarder tell me where to put this? Or can, can your algorithms tell me where this should go without having to need uh, a barcode reader or using that as a failure? So anyone that's involved in the process that, that understands and knows that there's typically places that are monitored, whether they're highly sensitive or they're, um, they're areas that require humans to, to make those kinds of decisions, um, that's the first step. I mean, conceptualize, okay. what can I replace it with, with, or can I enhance it with uh, AI computer vision? Yeah, no, that, that makes good sense. Because when I was a VP of operations, we had some cameras looking at, you know, like you said, some quality checks on the line. So what you're saying is anytime that you have, that you have or you could have a camera uh, checking, checking something, it may make sense. Uh, to automate the process with AI and allow it to really differentiate more than a human eye can is what you're saying and then supplement it with uh, like you said it could enhance the process exactly we've, we've got a liquor distributor that that hand builds pallets when they're not when they're not shipping full pallets of a specific liquor and when they for some reason uh, it's not possible for them to scan barcodes to build this out so our cameras are able to recognize the brand of the cases of the liquor as it's being put on, and it returns uh, a completed uh, manifest of what is on that pallet by the time that the person has completed it. Um, don't know, don't quite know why they were unable to deploy a simple, uh, you know, RF scanner or anything like that. But this is what they wanted to do, and and um, it was relatively simple to deploy and train the algorithm to do and it's it sits in the background and when they're finished boom there's there's your there's your manifest of what you just created interesting what about um uh, i know that you know they they won't be able to calculate a return on investment uh just off top of your off top of their heads or you could do the same but uh is there some way where they can tell or that is there things they can look for where they can tell whether or not what they're going to suggest or their idea has some merit where it is likely to return, um, you know, money to and, the bottom line. Yeah, ROI is always always upfront, which is why I characterize what we look at and what we what we look for are high value video feeds, typically high value uh, areas of an operation. For example, the cannabis, uh, that's a high value crop and specific stages of the growth are susceptible to rapid decline if they're not paid attention to. So it makes uh, a lot of sense to use AI computer vision to use that as a failover. Um, typically though, the hardware is relatively inexpensive. It's usually off the shelf HD close circuit television products that are available. Heck, you could get some of them on Amazon and most, if not all places, already have a CCTV system in place. The only thing that has to happen is that um, a feed be, uh, a port be opened up so that the data feed, the specific video feed 
uh, over it is whatever it is we're observing is allowed to go to the cloud so that we can run our analytics against. So hardware is less costly. The, that's a good the algorithms. Point. That, um, say again. I, I said that's a good point. I'm glad you bring that up because you know giving them a, a, an idea of you know what's a ballpark even mean. Yeah. Is a great point. Like, do you have like a range maybe? Like, I, I realize it totally depends on the application, but. Um, yeah, it, it depends on the application, but it's our service is typically a software service, and it can okay. range on uh, annual license video feed from ten thousand to twenty thousand dollars. Okay, yeah, that's. I mean, that's not bad. And how about the hardware components? I know that that also can vary, but yeah, I mean, uh, a good HD like camera, few hundred dollars, whatever your network guy needs to do to run cable to it, and then uh, incorporate it into your existing system. Maybe a uh, uh, thousand or two thousand to create um, an aggregate box, and then use that to be able to push video feed from that one specific area to uh, the cloud for us to be able to um, to analyze. So, and and again, I, I stress that it, it depends upon the challenge, and it depends upon right. uh, on on what it is that we're looking at. Because while many of them are conceptually similar there they can be vastly different in ease of um, in, and how much is involved in training the algorithm that's that's where the biggest uh, one of the biggest upfront costs comes into is being able to train your algorithm or provide video and data to be able to train it and that's typically um, having enough historical video and examples of what it is that you want to be able to identify to train it with hmm, interesting no, that, that's great. Because what, what that sounds like to me is is that it's um, it's really not it's not a significant investment. So it's likely that you could return a, a nice return, uh, in addition to um, avoiding quality issues, which is of course part of the return. But right, that's well, like, like like for example, the tunnel boring machine that's going under LA. That process there, if when it was rely one hundred percent reliant on. Uh, a person to recognize it. Every mistake usually costs upwards of forty to fifty thousand dollars in downtime. So it was relatively easy to do to to prove an ROI in that case. And again, and and again, it's typically a high value uh, component of either the manufacturing process or or um, an area of production that. Um, is particularly critical that, that this makes the most sense for. This is not intended to to uh, to watch uh, security door because the security uh, companies that are out there already do employ computer vision to be able to um, identify intruders and, and that sort of thing without requiring a human. Our, we're 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 levels deeper than that, looking at specific very high value um, processes. Interesting. So. No, that 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 helps a lot. Now, how about uh, AI in general? You know, we hear a lot of talk about it, so it makes it you know everybody's interested in learning more. Uh, you know, they say things like AI is going to take over, take over all sorts of industries, and you know that there's lots of comments made about it. What's your thinking in terms of AI at a high level, and you know what do you think we we should be thinking about? Yeah. <laughs> And that, that's a tough one because the um, head engineer's response to me when I was asking how it works just just keeps pinging around in the back of my head. It's like, well, it's complex algorithms, but at the end of the day, we really don't know how it works. I mean, so you know, I could let my my um, imagination run riot with with all sorts of scenarios of doomsday when everything starts talking to each other and then it no longer needs humans. But I honestly don't think it'll ever get that. You, you talk to some of the real big thinkers like like um, academics, uh, Sergey Brin, um, a lot of these guys think at some point in the future that might be what they call singularity where it all comes together and starts learning but I, I don't think so um, I think I think it'll continue to develop I think I think as far as careers go it's a great 
it's a, a great place to be in terms of if, if you're into computer science and you want to understand within your own workplace uh, what the potential is for it there. It's, it's never going to completely uh, eliminate the need for humans. Uh, in the foreseeable future. I, I hope it doesn't ever completely eliminate the need for humans because then we'd all be up a, up a creek without a paddle. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think the same. I mean, I think that is much more likely. And we had a symposium about uh, people or robots, I mean, similar with AI. And really, the experts there were saying, you know, like, we need to work together. <laughs> in a way that yeah. gives us better results but um, most examples are when you know it depends on the industry of course but for the most part um, when companies implement the right technology it supplements what they're doing and you know just ha it may change the uh, needs for different types of skills but um, um, then there's several examples of people who automated a bunch of things and then they actually ended up hiring people you know right Exactly. I was at a I was at a, an expo uh, Thursday and Friday, and one of the sessions was on artificial intelligence, and and the moderator made uh, an observation that the particular deployments of, that we were talking about is AI with a human touch, which okay that makes sense because I don't know there is even with as incredibly um, powerful as AI computer vision and other aspects of AI can be, it's not 100% foolproof. There always has to be a person there to be able to look at that and determine whether or not what the AI is concluding is in fact what is included. That's, that's why I don't think you're going to see completely uh, human-free cockpit in commercial airlines, even though most of it's done by computers and, and, and AI can be deployed there. To help, but it will. I think it will always re remain in the realm of a tool to help people. Yeah. It'll, I don't think it's going to completely replace them. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Now, if anybody has any uh, additional questions, um, please submit them through the Q and A portion um, or the chat portion uh, of the website. Um, and now, Craig, since you brought up that you, I'm sure you do attend those conferences you were talking about on AI. Is there any, um, you know, it, it could relate to the uh, computer vision piece or just AI in a general sense, but are there any um, like trends or things to watch for or watch, watch out for that they're talking about in these conferences since you, um, since I know you're, you know, now, but now becoming expert in all of this since, since it re really relates to what you're doing. Well, you, you kind of touched on it in, in the introduction. AI is on everybody's lips. Every, everything, oh, artificial intelligence, AI this, AI that. I think it's still pretty early uh, in the adoption phase. Um, there's lots of opportunities. Uh, and as you can see, one of the things that we're doing in Intrinsics is looking at the granular level for those opportunities uh, to use AI to help with high value video feeds, in particularly high value um, industries. Yeah. But, you know, I haven't heard anybody express too many fears other than the futurists who, who, play, who, who tend to paint the bleak dystopian future where the robots are running everything and we're, 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 we're relegated to being able to serve them as either batteries ourselves, like, like on the Matrix. I mean, there's all sorts of crazy dystopian futures that you can portray but nobody seems to be no, nobody seems to be afraid of that everybody's excited at the potential that it that it um that it tr that it really does mean um i haven't gotten too many people that are freaked out by it yet well and i'm thinking that the folks like on this uh webinar can easily um become a hero at their company by you know finding opportunities and suggesting uh, yeah. where, where we can enhance the quality or enhance the uh, uh, success rate or, um, or you know, reutilize somebody in a better, better place um, yeah. instead Pro of doing manual work. <laughs> process, continuous improvement, um, Six Sigma, all of those, uh, anybody that's involved in quality control in, in their company, 
or process improvements or identifying new technologies to be able to help. This is this is one of those tools that's that's um, that's out there that uh, has people talking but not quite sure on exactly how it would work. Um, the asphalt shingle example that I provided. Asphalt shingles have essentially been made the same way that they've been made for the last 50 years. I mean, the, the plants that we've visited, they're dirty, ugly, smelly, um, harsh environments, but essentially the technology hasn't changed and it won't change because it's, it's, it, asphalt shingles are asphalt shingles. There's, there's, there's no Apple, um, innovation disruptor on the horizon for that process. However, what they're doing and what manufacturers um, with, with mature technologies are doing are looking for opportunities to use uh, leapfrog new technologies to be able to uh, incrementally improve the output of those like through the quality control. I mean, so, so it's, I'm applying hot, hot tar to fiberglass. Um, Nobody, not until recently, they've, they've started thinking, well, can computer vision help here? And in our case, it is. Um, so there, there's lots of, when you, start, when you understand what the technology is, when you understand what it can do, then it sort of opens your eyes up to the, the potentials in your production line or out on the road, uh, you know, there's all sorts of technologies that are out there that are just, that are still young, that, um, that present a sort of a painter's palette that depending upon your situation, you could use this one, depending on this, you could use this one. Um, Very true. Now, do you have um, uh, suggestions for, you know, if we wanted to learn more about AI and computer vision, um, so that we can, uh, you know, uh, be more successful as we think of applications and bring it up. Uh, do you have any uh, suggestions as to how we can learn more about it? So most of the most of the nerd information can be found on university uh, uh, research centers. Simple Google searches. I mean, when I started, that's pretty much what I did. I mean, I just started searching, okay, computer vision, artificial intelligence, and there's so much information on it. It's interesting because, because uh, artificial intelligence in many cases is open source technology. All of it's out there. You could, if you knew how to do it, do it yourself. And, and there's tons of resources that are available to talk about the various technologies, talk about the, um, the technical aspects of it, as well as the potential practical applications for it. So um, there isn't one place that I can think of that um, would provide, but simple Google, I mean, there's just so much information on it since it is such a hot topic nowadays. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very true. Well, from that point of view, uh, that's a good point. So does, uh, does Intrinsics have a patent on uh, some, uh, I, I'm assuming you, you do, we do, on certain applications perhaps. Yes, yeah. yeah makes sense, huh, very good. Well, that's, well, that's re really, um, really interesting. I think we've provided a lot of food for thought uh, and certainly whether you're a, um, a planner, a buyer, an executive, um, a technology person, I think learning more about AI and computer vision can go a long way because there's a lot of applications. And like, like Craig said, as you open your mind to the possibilities, uh, you might be driving some substantial value in your company. So it's worth, um, worth and, and, thinking about it. Keep, keep in mind, at, at the core of it, of artificial intelligence, computer vision, if you can see it and recognize or classify it, if you can see it, Computer vision algorithms can be taught to do the same. Oh yeah, that's that's interesting too. There's there's plenty of um, plenty of um, opportunities as it as it's as it sits here. Yep. So uh, with that said, then I think I'm going to see if I can show you my uh, computer screen now. Let's see. All right. So uh, can you uh, you can see my uh, the Apex and Lin Empire website, Craig? Yes. All right. Well, excellent. Well, then, 
uh, I want to thank Craig for um, for this uh, really interesting webinar. I know that we'll have a lot of people um, looking at it um, later as well after work. And um, so we may have some questions. Actually, from that point of view, you you had the website up there, uh, Craig. But who would you would you like us to contact you or? Yeah, reach out to me. Okay. Um, what to, uh, what what information do you want to you want to give us your email address or what would you like to give us? Yes, my email address is csmith at intrinsicsimaging.com. Email me, direct, me directly. I'm on LinkedIn if you want to connect with me and, and, and talk more about it. Um, I love having conversations, whether I'm educating somebody or somebody's educating me on specific markets or aspects of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, ver thank you very much, Craig. And uh, as a reminder, uh, I brought up the Apex uh, homepage. Um, check it out. We have several CPIM classes starting shortly, and we're going to um, have CSCP and CLTD starting in the new year. So you want to sign up early. And we have our uh, symposiums, uh, symposium coming up. And uh, Take a look at it online. Uh, we also sent a um, announcement out recently, but uh, this is the um, um, current flyer for the symposium on collaborating for advanced manufacturing and supply chain success on November 9th. We hope you'll uh, join us, and um, we have some very interesting um, additional panelists that are um, going to be um, joining us soon. So I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. I guess I will check really quick to make sure I don't have any additional questions here. Let's see. Stop share. Okay, nope, we don't. So very good. Well, thank you. Have a great um, rest of the day. And thank you, Craig, for, um, for sharing your expertise with us. And we'll, um, um, you know, we'll, we'll join you at a future event. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.